I'm a landscape architect. Uh, I'm also a city planner. I've been working in heritage for the last 20 years. I have a design firm, a consulting firm in Washington that, that looks at historic roads and planning for historic roads. I'm actually over here right now working on my PhD in landscape architecture at Edinburgh University. So I've spent enough time over here to know what a really lovely evening it is. And I was really wondering if anyone would even show up tonight, <laughs> given the weather, because I probably would be disinclined to come out tonight. So I, I very much appreciate the fact, fact that you're here. Um, what I want to do tonight is uh, introduce some of my work, but also tie it into the new uh, Scottish Scenic Roots program uh, that Angus is going to be talking about after. And uh, these are great ideas to get people out, see the country, go for a relaxing drive. But I'd like to talk to philosophically frame this in terms of some of the ideas of the origins of pleasure driving. Why do people actually go pleasure driving in the first place? And kind of take this back to some, some British theory. Scotland's really important in this story, which is one of the reasons why I'm over here working on my PhD. Um, and then I'll segue into a little bit of the Scenic Byways program uh, in the United States. So, <clears throat> Little Threads of Civilization. I'll talk about this a little bit later, but the title comes from a journal, the introduction to a journal. Robert Southey, the poet laureate, and Thomas Telfer, the great civil engineer, went on a six-week driving tour in the Highlands in 1819. And the preface to the book, which was published in 1929, after it had been lost for years, actually referred to these roads as little threads of higher civilization. And I thought it's really a nice way of thinking about mobility in the landscape. And you have a really uh, lovely image here. Uh, this is from the Yale Center for British Art. So like I said, I got thinking about the program here, plans in Scotland for a national system of touring routes and how this might all kind of philosophically work together. And this is like one of my favorite images from the National Library. And this too, I mean this really captures the idea of pleasure driving to me. Uh, this is clearly no frustration being lost on the side of the highway. This is someone who's kind of very happily here just studying, studying the Bartholomew's, Bartholomew's map. And we see lots of these images uh, in the early auto age, which is my particular area of experience back in the States, in terms of the automobile getting people out into the landscape. Uh, and I really want to talk tonight a lot about the role of landscape architects, which is really influential in these roads in terms of designing them, in terms of identifying them. Uh, well into the 20th century, a role I think certainly in the States we seem to have lost uh, recently. So here we have uh, sunny Southern California and a day in the Denver Mountain Parks, the new Denver Mountain Parks. Uh, and look at this image, oh, don't trip over here. Look at these, look at the roads here and it continues on uh, and you just kind of Uh, but this idea of the automobile, and you can see it's sponsored by the Tourism Bureau. So the automobile and tourism. And I know Visit Scotland's involved with. So, I mean, to me, this kind of captures the idea of, of pleasure driving. Uh, this is the kind of, you know, just absolute kind of fantasy idea. Anybody traveled Route 66 in the States? Okay. You should, more Europeans travel it than Americans, interestingly. Um, so this is the kind of romanticized image of pleasure traveling. This is also kind of the reality. Uh, route 66 took you to California Route 9, 99. Uh, during the Dust Bowl, during the Great Depression, 66 was the route of migration. It was a real horrible road of people that had lost everything in life. And they kind of arrived here with the little bit that they owned, hoping for a new and better life. So it wasn't really a pleasure drive for them heading off you know, Route 66. Uh, they were getting no kicks on this uh, at all. Uh, <clears throat> and then just the idea of pleasure driving in general. You know, sometimes we kind of set out with an intention of having a really lovely afternoon in the Highlands or wherever we're going to go, uh, and things that kind of just get in the way uh, in terms of one of the signals tonight that stop my taxi getting over here efficiently for a little bit of highway works. Uh, the idea of, of crowded highways here, you can see the picnic basket and the, the family. Uh, and then how we've tried to solve these problems over the year. You can see this is from the Oregonian in, in Portland, Oregon on the west coast of America, 1949, uh, the old Columbia Highway and the new water grade route. So out, everybody's happy. The sightseers are over there, commerce is here. These are really important questions with scenic route programs in terms of are there conflicts of uses between local people, commerce, and people who are visiting and enjoying the scenery, which you might have seen a hundred times over 
and don't really need to see again. So this is making reference to the Columbia River Highway. And I just want to introduce this. Um, constructed between 1913 and 1922, this is one of the first automobile pleasure roads constructed in the United States. It goes along the Columbia River Gorge uh, in the Pacific Northwest. This is Vista House. We'll talk about this a little bit later. It was modeled on the Axenstrasse, which was a, a carriage driving road uh, in Switzerland around Lake Luzerne, uh, which was built for pleasure driving in the 19th century. And if you look at the parapet wall there, you'll see parallels. Actually, look at that parapet wall and look right back at the cartoon even. It's, the cartoon's very correct architecturally. And here's kind of one of the classic shots of the road, uh, very romanticized. There was a whole kickoff because of this road and another, the Bronx River Parkway, which I'll mention in a few minutes, that kicked off pleasure driving in the United States. And these were roads that were constructed specifically to drive on for pleasure. Uh, they were built to provide scenic experiences within the landscape. This is Beach Drive in Washington, D.C., where I happen to grow up. Uh, this is the Boulder Bridge. It still looks exactly like this today, except the trees are considerably larger. Um, so just a few definitions as we're getting into this, which I think are helpful. Driving for pleasure, and this is when you think about a scenic routes program, these are things to be think about in terms of clients and audience intended outcomes. Driving for pleasure is when people are going for a drive simply because they want to enjoy the experience of that particular landscape for that drive. Um, there's no destination that's necessary at all. It's all about the drive. Pleasurable driving is when you may have a destination, you're going to visit family down south, uh, but you peak route A over B because it's a more interesting drive. Um, so you're, you're taking a more pleasurable route, but you still have a, a destination that's intended. Which gets into some of what I'm looking at, roads designed for pleasure and roads adapted for pleasure. I'll be talking first about roads designed for pleasure. We have a lot of these in the United States because the automobile was coming online and we were growing, so we built a lot of these roads, specifically constructed for pleasure driving. And the second roads adapted for pleasure, which I think is going to be a lot of what your programs will be looking at here, and certainly a lot of our scenic Bibles program as well. Roads that were constructed for other purposes, but because of their location in the landscape setting environment, have become identified and become popular touring routes over time. So roads designed for pleasure. I just, this is that Columbia River Highway. Uh, you can see it's, it's dramatic, these basalt cliffs on the Columbia River. <coughs> The Bronx River Parkway, uh, this is just north of New York City. This is the first automobile parkway. A parkway is a road that's designed for pleasure driving, uh, generally associated in an urban area. And the purpose of a parkway, historically, is to connect an urban area to a larger significant park des designation, destination. So the idea, and this is all coming out of the minds of landscape architects, is that rather than having the city here and the nice mountain park there, if we could connect these by a ribbon of green and make it a pleasurable touring trip, we would really intensify the experience for the visitor and heighten the landscape appreciation as well. So this is the Bronx River Parkway, 1906, 1927. The idea from this actually comes from Scotland when you read the records uh, back. A group of Americans were over here. They were in Aberdeen, and they were impressed by the fact that the water in the city was clear when most American rivers were really filthy. Um, which got the idea of like maybe this river, the Bronx River, could be restored. Um, the restoration led to the idea of the restored landscape, which led to the idea of the new automobile and having the pleasure route uh, going through. Now, if you drive this today, it's taking your life into your own hands, but we'll talk about that later. Um, but you can see here some of these additional ideas for it. Um, all the local streets pass over under the parkway. So the idea that we think of commonly with motorways today in terms of automobile use comes from the Bronx River Parkway. Also, which goes back to common law which we adopted in the United States, historically if you owned property along a public highway, you have right of access. The Bronx River Parkway was the first in the United States to challenge this whole idea, to maintain the landscape experience. People that had abutting property did not have right of access onto the parkway, to maintain the landscape experience. Now, we quickly adopted that for our interstate system, motorway system. Uh, we it today as limited access highways. Uh, but the idea of limited access, that, that fence along the edge of the motorway, um, comes out of landscape architecture theory and the desire to provide a corridor that's 
defined with the landscape and the people in the vehicle within the landscape have this pristine experience is protected and all the traffic, like I said, goes over or under and you focus on the landscape and your destination at the park. See, the parkway was not designed as an important arterial way. No one thought that the idea of limited access would lead to suburbanization and easy long distance traveling because the automobile was still very new. And these were really seen very much purely as the idea of getting people from the city center with the streetcars and the trains and all the transportation infrastructure that we had and getting them out into the country. And this starts changing really around World War II, a little bit before. Um, <coughs> you can see it's planned as a pleasant recreational drive. Um, it's protected on both sides of its entire length. That's the really new idea here. And importantly, too, you can see the engineers and the landscape architects are working side by side. It's a very cooperative environment during this period. Yeah. We're going to walk backwards in history a little bit. But trust me, this is all going to make some sense, I hope. Some of these ideas come from Central Park in New York City um, with the idea of separating uses. Uh, so here you see the pedestrian promenade going over the carriage drive right here. So Central Park has a system of carriage drives, bridle paths, and pedestrian paths. Um, and to ensure that every user would have the best park experience, the entire system was separated. One always goes over and under. You very seldom actually intersect. Um, Think about if you've maybe been out walking along one of the canals, you're kind of enjoying looking at things and someone buzzes by on a mountain bike or something and you just, I kind of want to put a stick in the spoke there. <laughs> I'm there for a specific reason and that conflict of users, we still deal with it today. The point at Central Park was to separate these different user groups. Um, <clears throat> and the idea of separated uses then with the parkways gets applied to through traffic and local traffic. You can see one of the, the underpasses here. You can see Calvert Fox, the English architect, and Frederick Law Olmsted, the American landscape architect, on the arch here. So in addition to the three-tier system up here, there are four roads. I don't know if you ever noticed when you were in the park. There are four city streets that cut through the park. They're transverse roads. You can see them down here below. The city commercial leaders were terrified that this park would block what's this, why Central Park where it is. It's the least valuable land in the city in the middle 19th century. New York's a port city. The water matters, the middle does not. That's why the park is here. And getting from this part of the water, from the East River to the Hudson River was really important. Having this like bit of green in the middle was just a bad idea. Uh, so the park competition required four transverse roads. What Olmsted and Vox did was they depressed them with these land bridges to allow the through city traffic to pass beneath the park. All the other plans had kind of boulevards run across, which would mean as you walked along the park, you'd be regularly intersected by a major city, city boulevard. So this idea of separating multiple uses really comes out of landscape architecture and the parks movement. Uh, and Central Park becomes a huge destination for recreational driving, pleasure driving. Birkenhead Park in Liverpool is widely credited with being the inspiration for Central Park. Um, so here's our, we're stepping back uh, in history. Very sophisticated carriage drive system at Birkenhead Park for pleasure driving. So Olmsted, as a young man, actually travels, this is before Central Park. He was really known first as a writer. Um, he travels, he has a farm. The farm's not doing very well. And he convinces his father, if I could just go to Europe and study modern farming techniques, I'm sure I could do much better. So he goes on a three-month tour all over Europe um, and writes a book, Walks and Talks of an American Farmer uh, in England. But five minutes of admiration and a few more spent in studying the manner in which art had been made, employed to obtain from nature so much beauty. And I was ready to admit that in democratic America, there was nothing to be thought of as comparable to this people's garden. It's a really nice endorsement of, of Birkenhead Park and the concept behind the park. Olmsted works with Fox. Fox is the English architect. Um, I love this. Every American who is in the habit of traveling, which is almost equivalent to saying every American. Fox really catches on to the American identity very quickly. But in his book, Villas and Colleges, he talks at length about the design of roads and how they should move through and be related to the landscape. And one of the things I'm trying to do with my dissertation is demonstrate that these landscape architects spend a lot of time talking about 
roads and circulation in the landscape. Andrew Jackson Downing, our first great landscape designer, was the guy that actually came to London and brought Calvert Box to the United States. He says that Humphrey Repton is one of the most celebrated English practical landscape gardeners. And then you can see his talk about having these country roads as part of his advocacy for the hope to have a public park in New York City. And one of the big ideas with this will be this idea of this road network where people will get out of the city and travel on these country roads. Repton is published in 1830 by John Claudius Loudon, a Scot. I'm sure you all know about Loudon. Um, he keeps Repton's writings, uh, prolific writings, uh, alive. And we get to Repton, Humphrey Repton. Uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with Repton's red books. Um, Repton wrote a lot on circulation, and he had a hierarchy of road types with the landscapes that he worked in. Uh, this was hardly a passing thing. At one point, he talks about the fact that there's one thing people don't understand. I'm paraphrasing. Uh, if one, one thing people don't understand and don't do properly, it's the idea of roads and circulation in the landscape. So this is more than just kind of a, a passing mention. This is Sheringham in Norfolk. Uh, you can see here, the, this is the before. Repton's famous for his, his uh, slides or, 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 or flips. And you can see this kind of pop out. And what I love about this is it's all about the approach drive. Um, this is later in his career, and he actually talks about leaving this kind of rough kind of cut in the landscape unfinished. And he references the scalp in the Wicklow Mountains in Ireland, where he had visited as a young man as kind of his inspiration for this kind of way to kind of set off the kind of picturesque idea of the landscape, a bit of a rugged landscape. And here you can see a bit, bit of a, a detail. Now, it's a slightly exaggerated. Uh, that's, that's the Red Book image. You can see the height of the hills, the, the descent of the road. This is what it is in, in reality. Uh, but what Repton did really brilliantly well, because uh, when I went here last year, uh, the ranger for Natural Trust said, you're going to be disappointed. It's not, like, it's not like the Red Book you've been looking at, because the hills aren't as high. But Repton captured in the Red Book the feeling, the feeling of coming around that corner. I was getting really annoyed. I was trying to get this shot, because I thought I might be able to use it maybe tonight. And um, people kept cluttering this up, leaning there, you know, oh, you know, we should stop at Sainsbury's on the way home because, you know, what, sh what should we have for I thought, get out of my shot. Um, <laughs> but I realized they're all congregating there because Repton really knew the exact spot in the landscape, and he nailed it. And that's why it was cluttered with people. Um, and I finally did ask one group to just leave after point. Um, <laughs> so they're kind of back this way, slightly grumpy. Um, <laughs> So, um, this is Blaise Castle down in Bristol. Um, probably one of his most sophisticated road constructions. Repton dis distinguished two types of roads, carriage drives and approach roads. Approach road was to go from the public road to the house. And it was supposed to be relatively direct. Because when you get someplace and you've had a long journey, you want to get there. You don't want to go on a five hour tour of the property. Um, so we distinguish between the approach road, which should be attractive and show some of the qualities of the landscape, but not to try to show everything. Because once people cross through that gatehouse, they want to be able to get a sense that they're going to be arriving. The approach road is in orange. And then there's a series in green. These are the carriage drives. These are based purely on pleasurable driving and seeing the property at your leisure. And Repton established a series of what he called stations. Uh, in terms of these would be places with views, seats, and he had a whole cadence, and this really influences the American Parkway system later, about having dramatic points of interest and then what he kind of, kind of called soft or quiet landscape, because if it's all spectacular, you get bored after a while. So he articulates this idea about as you move through the landscape, there should be these kind of like really big sparks, then these quiet areas, then another spark, then another resting area. So it's really about the idea of designing based on mobility in the landscape. Uh, and you can see here uh, a road where nature never intended, okay, we can actually build these things, we have technology. Vehicles of modern luxury, nature must be conquered by art. This is a reference to the picturesque movement. Um, beauties which may be brought before the eye in succession by the windings of the road. That's all this idea of kinesthetic design, mobility. Uh, it's not static. 
These are some of the walls that hold up the approach drive going into Blaise Castle. Uh, it's a really incredibly engineered. Look at this here. And there's a whole series that begins up here as this road you just saw on the map snakes down the side of the hill. There was already a road that went to the house. Um, the whole point of this is to have a new approach that shows off the landscape. This, again, is the relatively direct road. Uh, and it is relatively direct, but it's way more scenic than the existing public road that was the, the, the service. So you think about the investment to, to build something like this as an approach road when there's already another way to get there anyway. It's all about the landscape. He talks a lot about uh, kind of the nouveau riche moving into the countryside and putting up uh, plantations and fences. This is, the, this is the before, this is the after. He has some very sarcastic comments on people not appreciating the scenery from the public highway. And just here's the approach uh, road at Woburn Abbey. I can see, again, the before and after and how he really looks at how you experience and move through the landscape. <coughs> I'm sure many of you have probably seen this. This is a pretty famous, this is his own house. Uh, and you kind of see the, the really sinister looking peg leg guy right here leaning over his <laughs> garden fence. Um, a lot of people accused Repton of being deceitful uh, with, his, with his Red Book illustrations. Um, the more I've studied and read him, he had a really good sense of humor. And I, I, I really believe this was not to be the extreme uh, before and after, like the sinister guy's gone. But he's, he's poking fun at himself late in life. And I think he's kind of doing the ultimate, you know, here's this dastardly guy leaning over the garden fence. Um, but if you just do this, he's gone. You know? <laughs> uh, so there's a little bit more of, of a detail there. Um, but this is uh, uh, in his, his last book in 1816. And uh, he talks about uh, the cheerful village the high road, and the constant moving scene, which I would not exchange for any of the lonely parks I have improved for others. Okay. I pref others prefer still life. I delight in movement. Okay. So again, it's this idea of the animation within the landscape. He really understood circulation. So what I would like to suggest to you is Repton was the first landscape designer that had this opportunity. There's a convergence that happens right around 1800. Um, with landscape theory being Repton, road engineering, vehicle design, and the picturesque movement. If you think about building a road for pleasurable driving and going for a pleasurable drive, there's a lot of things that have to come into play. You can have a beautiful landscape, but if the road is miserable, you're not going to enjoy it. It's not until the end of the 18th century that modern road technology really allows the construction of reliable and smooth pavements. Until you have that, why bother? Um, two Scots, Thomas Telford and John Latham McAdam, really are instrumental in establishing modern paving theory that we still use today. It still forms the basis of modern paving in terms of drainage and layering, good subsurface, and how things get built up. McAdam was actually utilized in the United States. Uh, this is the first, this is a, in the 1920s and 30s, the Bureau of Public Roads, which is the predecessor of our Federal Highway Administration today, had an artist who painted romantic ideas of young nation and transportation infrastructure. And this is actually the McAdam being installed on our first public highway. And you can see the three different levels of graded stone stacking up here. So it's a very, it's a very informative image if you look at it very carefully. I was reading. Um, some of the parliamentary inquiries Loudon is brought to Parliament to talk about building modern roads. And uh, you can think about politicians today, okay, and just go back and think nothing's changed. One of the questions he's asked, because the rocks were broken by hand. There was no mechanical crushing at this point. So women and children didn't do that work. And one of the questions from one of the members of Parliament was, were the women and children more efficient seated or standing? And Loudon said they're more efficient seated. I've read enough of Loudon, I'm sorry, McAdam. I've read enough of McAdam. I'm, he doesn't strike me as really socially responsible. So I'm not sure if he was doing it just to give the women and children a chance to be seated or if they actually had tried it both ways and found out, like, break them while you're sitting down. Uh, but there's lots of inquiries into modern road building or modern, modern road making, as it's called. 
Um, New York City, we mentioned the drives. You can see here the broad carriage roads surface like polished steel. Vertical Olmsteads insist they use the Telford method to construct the roads in Central Park, even though at this point macadam paving, which has already been demonstrated reliable and cheaper, but Telford is more heavily constructed and Olmsted thought it was essential for the, the heavy wear and tear the park was going to get. And then vehicle design. I'm not going to bore you with all this because I do not want to do a dissertation on, on carriages, but suffice to say it's not until the end of the 18th century that vehicles became comfortable to travel in because of the Industrial Revolution, comfortable suspension, and even more importantly, safe braking. You're not going to go on a precipitous drive up through the highlands just to look at scenery when there's a good chance that the carriage could kind of just break and roll away. So we have safe braking and we have comfortable suspension, which gives people the idea that actually driving can be, can be safe. Uh, look at this in Britain. From 1810 to 1900, 15,000 to 320,000 carriages, pleasure vehicles. What's happening? To, this is the age of the railways. Okay? The numbers should not be doing this intuitively. It should be doing that. It's the same in the United States. Carriage ownership in New York City spikes after Central Park opens. This is all because of pleasure driving. People are moving around efficiently on the railways at this point. Uh, we start building speedways because people are speeding in the parks. So American cities start developing pleasure roads where you can actually drive with no, no speed limitation uh, at all. And this actually has three pedestrian undercrossings as well uh, for safety. Uh, I like the, here's a, a, a light park phaeton. And we transition into the 20th century novel, light park phaeton, and here's the Packard phaeton. <coughs> okay? We think like that era than the auto era. There's lots of, of filtering. There's lots of transference. Um, people recognize this name for a vehicle that had good views, was comfortable, enjoyed the countryside, and the Packard Motor Company picked the same name for the car that did the same thing. Comfortable, good views, nice open top. So we have road making, we have vehicle design, and last is just the idea of the picturesque movement people getting out into the landscape. And the theory which really gets established by William Gilpin, uh, he really kicks off the idea of picturesque touring. The end of the 18th century, there's a whole rush. North Wales, the Lake District, and the Highlands. These are the destinations if you're a serious picturesque traveler. And what you would do, would you would go and you would sketch and you would really understand the landscape. And there were all these books like this. <laughs> This is uh, Observations on the Highlands of Scotland. It's beautifully written. So people would go and they would tour and they would look at these roads and they would think about the landscape and the environment. If everyone still did this today, we'd be really brilliantly well off. This is where we segue into what I'm calling roads adapted for pleasure. These are not roads that Gilf Gilpin's promoting that were designed for pleasure touring. These are roads that just by circumstance had really lovely picturesque settings. A lot of these in the, in the Highlands were General Wade's military roads and then later roads that were constructed by Thomas Telford. So this is, um, this is the military road on the banks of Loch Lomond. Uh, and I'm just going to give you a quick little bit of Gilpin right here because his writing is just so absolutely lovely. The road accompanies the lake and is exceedingly grand and generally lofty in every part. Water and mountains are the removed part of the scene. Rocks and hanging woods adorn the foreground. Among them, at every turn of the road, the lake appears to much advantage. Uh, this road is one of the grand entrances into the highlands. And then he goes on to talk about its military origins. It's carved out of the rock, which is a nice surface. Uh, so this is a really useful book in terms of both touring and highway construction. Because people traveling at this time know what a good surface of a road is because they're used to having really bad road surfaces. Uh, so it becomes noteworthy in journals that the road surface is really, really quite fine. Uh, Sir Walter Scott, <coughs> the Waverly novels really kind of kick off a lot of the idea of touring in the Highlands as well. Here's a, uh, <coughs> painting of La Coutrine <coughs> from the National Gallery. you got to love Scott. What are we talking about here? I have seen the vehicle thunder down the hill that leads to the bridge 
with more than its usual impetuosity, glittering all the while by flashes from a cloudy tabernacle of the dust which it has raised, and leaving a train behind it on the road resembling a wreath of summer mist. What are we talking about? Dust. <laughs> the horrible dust and dirt being kept. Only Scott could turn it into a tabernacle and a wreath of summer mist. Um, but Scott, in the opening of, of Heart of Midlothian, talks a lot about the modern roads and the ability to travel from Edinburgh efficiently around Scotland, um, and the postal roads in particular that have linked up the entire nation now. He's very much aware of mobility. Mobility, read Jane Austen. She's always talking about different types of carriages and movement and travel and all that. Roads are a big part of the conversation in the general public right now because it's the thing that's happening, kind of like the railway swar or air travel or whatever. So, little threads of civilization. I want to just share with you a little bit, as I mentioned at the start, Robert Southey, the Poet Laureate, and Thomas Telford go on a six-week tour through the Highlands um, to look at roads and bridges and canals. Uh, it's a really grand, picturesque tour, and Southey, lead, Southey leads a detailed journal, uh, which is lost and it's republished in the early 20th century. And here we see, this is the 22nd of August, uh, about Loch Tay, uh, always within sight of the water, but considerably above it. Southey, as you read through this, really starts understanding road design and highway engineering. And he's talking here about the existing road, kind of typical engineering. It's the straight line, but it didn't take into account topography. And he's saying, you know, it might have been longer if it had been down along the lake, but the views probably would have been better, and it would have been an easier journey. Uh, so he really kind of gets this whole idea as he's moving through. And you really watch his appreciation of highway design opening up. The Falls of Clamark, um, you can see here in a shot, I'll just share with you, um, one of the new works and one of the most remarkable of them for the difficulty of constructing it. Okay. So Southey's being both the poet and kind of the artist here. Um, and you continue down, there's a, a, a lad angling knee deep in the water, and I love this, a woman was beating linen in the river, a practice which makes washing a cleanly and picturesque operation. Um, she might have had a different view on that. Um, and there's actually someone who went along a little bit later and kind of followed up some of these people in these really like horrible little houses uh, that were considered picturesque uh, by wealthy people traveling through. Um, but he's combining the picturesque, really importantly here, with highway construction, which is a thing you don't think about a whole lot. The road itself is an object which adds greatly to the beauty and interest of these scenes. Uh, it's carried on the side of the cliff, and in many places it's cut into the cliff, um, and in many supported by a high wall. Work of great labor, difficulty, and expense. Uh, so again, he's talking about the construction. He goes on about turfing of banks and all kinds of things like that uh, as well. The Lovett Bridge. Again, think about if you work for government, not spending enough money or just spending just enough. Nothing's changed, <laughs> okay? Um, he's talking about the nice double line here over the arches, uh, but the bottom line is it would have been nice to have a balustrade, but the government wouldn't pay for the balustrade. Um, Telford was doing as best as he could with limited funds, um, and, and Southey's saying, you know, for not a sixpence has been allowed for ornament of these public works, in these public works. And he makes a similar complaint here uh, as well, the beautiful iron work, and then, you know, you know, <laughs> this farthing wisdom must now appear in everything that government undertakes, and thus the appearance of this fine bridge has been sacrificed for the sake of saving, quite pitiful in such a work. He understands the long-term investment in the highlands. He knows these bridges and roads are going to be around for generations, for centuries, as we can see today. Um, and he's understanding now is in time to make that slight extra percent investment in terms of legacy. But, you know, we, we certainly appreciate these for what they are today and the, and the beauty that they are today. Again, I mentioned this before. So their tour ends in Glasgow. Uh, they kind of part their ways. I'll get you back to Edinburgh real quick. And then a very quick segue to the United States. So I'll use the last few minutes here and give you a brief introduction to the American Scenic Byways Program. Um, there's a new exhibit on American Impressionism at the, the Modern. Uh, it's quite nice. This is Child Hassam, who's one of my favorite American Impressionists. Uh, this is actually a shot of Fifth Avenue, New York City, at the end of World War I. 
So I'm going to take you on a, a quick little drive here and show you some of the American Scenic Byways program and our, our Parkway legacy and how this really kind of ties back, I would say, very directly to, to Repton. Hopefully I've given you a very nice thread moving through here. Uh, even the sign that you see here is we have a term in the United States we call park rustic, which our national parks are based on. It's, it's rubbly, it's wood, it's handcrafted. Um, it really comes out very much out of the, the, out of the picturesque idea. Skyline Drive. This is just outside of Washington, D.C. This was built during the Depression as a pleasure drive. It still is, is this. It goes no place to no place. Uh, and if you extend it down to the Blue Ridge Parkway, it's about a two-day drive from no place to no place, uh, which people do religiously. It is a brilliantly beautiful drive along the spine of the Blue Ridge Mountains. And it's all about the picturesque views bursting upon the scene. If you drive down this parkway, You'll be surrounded by woods. You have a view out to the one side, but it's blocked on the one side. Uh, you can read Repton and see the same thing. I maintain the plantation here. I broke the view to the Y River here. And it's the same thing about directing the eye with the landscape, controlling what people think is sort of an accidental or lovely view. The viewpoints, just like the stations that Repton talks about. Picturesque. This is a really interesting history of the National Park Service. This tunnel is completely not necessary. <laughs> it could have been very easily built uh, without, and it could have been still quite lovely, but people like going through tunnels. <laughs> um, so this was the best spot on the, 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 the ridge to do it, and they built a tunnel here. Uh, it's all about the landscape experience. And what this does is it really helps. This is about the midpoint of the original road, too. So it's a very nice kind of transition point, again, in terms of building these points of awareness and anticipation that Repton talks about. We see again at Central Park, and we see this all through the 19th century. Uh, so this is a, an all-American road. We have a two-tier scenic byways system. Uh, as I told Angus, I wouldn't necessarily recommend two tiers, but that's what we did 20 years ago. Uh, biking, uh, motor biking. Again, the details, particularly on national park roads. Let's see right here. And so I mean, the backs of the signs are all painted, so they disappear out into the landscape. A lot of times these nice, subtle little details really can take an average road and really transition them up to a much more elegant type of highway. Again, the park rustic, these are the original rails uh, from the 1930s. You would drive right through them today. Um, so they've been redesigned. Um, there's a modern block out, and there's steel backing on the back of this. Uh, there are ways to provide safety in scenic areas that don't have to take away from the safety of the facility or make it look like a motorway. I just mentioned you saw an All-American Road, the top of our National Snake Byways program. This is uh, in the state of Maryland. This is also an All-American Road, top of our Snake Byways program as well. This is our first federal highway in the United States. Uh, where People heading west could stop at KFC and fortify themselves for the long journey to the, the prairies. Here's a, a longer shot uh, in the mountains. It's a lovely landscape, uh, but it is the National Road. It's our first public highway, and this is the historic line of that road, which raises an interesting question. What's the purpose of a scenic byway in the United States? Is it scenery? It really should be called byways, not scenic byways, and I'll mention that in a second. Here's that same artist again. This is the, just a few miles from that spot that you just saw. This is the, the famous pass, McAdam Road. The road started in Maryland, uh, west of Washington, and made it all the way to the Mississippi River, almost to the Mississippi River. And then because of the railways, it just kind of, it was going to keep going west and west and west. McAdam. Now, just a few miles from the KFC, you see this as well. Uh, so there are really some really lovely spots on this road. This was the largest masonry arch bridge in the United States at the time it was built because of the importance of the road. So with that kind of contradictory introduction, the American Scenic Byways Program, this is the current collection that we have right now. This long line right here is our first national highway, 1806. So, established in 1991, it's a two-tier system, as I said. We have 31 of the top-tier roads. 
the intention is that these would be roads that you would drive, you would travel to just to drive the road. Like I was saying earlier, roads really just purely for pleasure. <coughs> and then we have 120 other roads uh, that are what we call just National Scenic Byways, which are supposed to be regionally representative of the culture and landscape of the United States. Uh, 46 states and 12 Indian nations have roads uh, listed. 35,000 miles of roads. Um, to be designated, you have to be a state or tribal byway. You have to complete what's called a corridor management plan and de designate the significance of six qualities. Just to give you a quick introduction. The Merritt Parkway in Connecticut, 37 miles. This was built as a pleasure drive. It was a parkway. So it's a road designed for pleasure. Each bridge was designed in a different style. Chesapeake Country and the state of Maryland, which links small villages and the Chesapeake water culture. So the road is really a conduit to provide introduction to culture and history of a region. It's a lovely drive, but the road is really what connects the, the history and the story. The Selma to Montgomery March Route from 1965. Uh, this is a road that's all about a story, and the period of significance, we would say, is about three days in terms of the Civil Rights March in 1965. The Flint Hills Byway, this is a really unique geologic region in the United States and home to the largest remaining prairie landscape in the country as well. I put this in as a caution here. I first worked in Scotland in 2000 when they were establishing the boundaries for Loch Lomond National Park. And people kept apologizing for the lowland scenery to me. <laughs> and it's my first time here. I think the lowlands are really beautiful. <laughs> um, so the problem we have in the United States is it's kind of all coastal and mountains. That's what we get. I think every nation tends to like, that's our iconic scenery, and this isn't our iconic scenery. But as you're moving forward, I encourage you to think very broadly about people from the outside, get rid of local perceptions, and think equally about how are you representing travel and the landscape through Scotland. Native American Scenic Byway in South Dakota. This is the Lakota Sioux Nation. It's a really nice uh, bit of public art. Las Vegas, all-American road, 4.5 miles. It's one of our shortest byways. And as the state director for tourism said, it's the most scenic byway by night. Um, <laughs> It was listed for history and culture. The state of Nevada came in and said, this is where gaming comes into the mainstream. <laughs> Big Sur, this is a road that's adapted for pleasure. This was not built as a pleasure drive, but it clearly is a pleasure drive. And because of the modern motorways, not horribly far away, it really is what people just use it for today anyway. And the Alaska Marine Highway, 3,500 miles. This is the ferry system in the state of Alaska, which is part of the federal highway system because of the remote aspects of Alaska. So, our byways can be designated for six qualities, archeological, cultural, historic, natural, recreational, and scenic. And I'm just gonna throw that up. Obviously, you know what's the difference between historic and cultural. You, know, you can slice these things different ways. Again, and I mentioned this when I was at Loch Lomond the other week, we would probably have done it differently. We've redefined these now really to be more about kind of human interactions, in natural landscape. That's the way they really kind of cluster. But it's a nice way to look at the structure of a system. Quarter management plan is required, which is supposed to be a community-based document that talks about why the road is important, what resources it has, and how it will be protected over time based on what's been identified as being of value. And there's 14 points, and uh, this will all be up on, on online for you. I'm just going to close out, show you the Columbia River Highway. We've talked about this a couple times. This is one of our all-American roads, and it's brilliantly well-managed. Again, original barriers you would drive right through. Redesigned based on the speed of the highway with steel backing, so it looks almost like the original barrier. It gives people that sense of being on a special type of a road. It's different than the regular road. <coughs> and that's what these pleasure drives were all about. It's not a regular road. It's a special road. Uh, stone, the parapet walls were really, really in bad shape. Uh, they've all been restored now. The road was documented for the Library of Congress to create a, a historical record of the construction, scenic inspiration, et cetera. You can go to the Library of Congress website and look these all up. Interpretation. And then Vista House. This was the really lovely expensive building for the public toilets is what it was. Uh, in really, really bad shape. Major restoration. 
but also a major issue for the Americans with Disabilities Act, how do you get people into a building that's up on a set of stairs? Uh, so you can see the ramp going up there along the side, and just kind of very nicely looks up. You can see your two of the ramp is at the entrance, uh, right by the entrance here. Uh, American law requires that uh, wheelchair access has got to be initiated at the beginning of the building. It can't be a back door, a secondary uh, perception of access. So it has to be proximate to the main door, which this is. It goes around the side. Then the problem is the toilets on the lower level in a historic listed structure. How do you deal with that? Uh, so you can see there's a, a lift right here that kind of just pops. pops right. This costs a lot of money. Uh, <laughs> And the preservation agency for the state of Oregon spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to do this. It was a very tricky thing to figure out to provide the required access by law and at the same time maintain the integrity of the building itself. It proves it can't be done, though. Uh, Oregon has one of the best state policies for historic roads. You can see it's public policy to preserve and restore. How often do transportation agencies talk like that? Uh, very good example. So there's always options. Hopefully I've given you a little bit of sense of some of the philosophical origins behind these types of things. That's my uh, website uh, and email. Um, I'm really excited by what you're doing. I think you've had a tremendously good opportunity here in Scotland. I've been able to travel through a lot of the country in the four years I've been over here at university. Uh, you've got some remarkable opportunities and some very clever people working at this. Um, and you have a very rich history to draw down on too in terms of the philosophical origins for these types of roads philosophical orgs for touring in the highlands and other parts of the country as well. So there's a very rich legacy here that I think you can really draw on. So I'm going to turn it over to Angus. I'll say thank you very much. And uh, we'll have some questions after an introduction to the new works here.